Well, thank you for taking the time to join me today. So I'm going to have a 35 minutes presentation, and I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to speak very fast. Let me first introduce myself. My name is Ted Liu Tiandong. So if you speak English, uh, please uh, use the headset for uh, interpreting. So I'm the co-founder of uh, Open Source Director. Please wait a second. I'm dealing with technical problems. Can you please help me with the pointer? It doesn't move here. Please wait a second. I hope it works. Can you please check the protector, the projector? Please wait a second. Let me try again. Sorry for keeping you waiting. Sorry, my slides are not shown on the projector. Sorry for keeping you waiting. So I'm Ted Liu, and uh, I'm the director of uh, Kai Yuan She, which is an open source club. I also work in Apache. So I'm a member of Apache. And uh, in China, there are 13 Apache ASF members, and I'm one of the 13 members in China. And I have uh, been working in two areas. Most of the time, um, I'm working on open source in mainland China. And the other part of my job is um, to work as the ASF incubator. And moreover, for some projects, I work as the mentor. So these are my responsibilities. <laughs> so currently, China so actually, um, from 2015, there were three programs in China, and now there are 14 projects of Apache in China. Some are from big companies or startups or from individuals. So they make use of uh, Apache platform for incubation, and then they were officially released up till now. There have been 14 projects in China, and among that, uh, nine are um, official programs, and the other five are still in incubation. And for Apache, I am also one of uh, the fundraiser committee members. I work with uh, Microsoft and uh, any other companies for sponsorship. In China, we have Huawei, Tencent, Baidu, Alibaba, 
and uh, one other company who are sponsoring Apache. So I work with uh, these uh, sponsors in China too. Can I continue with my presentation? I'll wait. I'll wait a few seconds. Okay, thank you for waiting. So, um, I'm going to talk about uh, Kai Yuan Shi, uh, which is uh, the open source society. And then um, I will give a brief introduction to it. And then I'll talk about uh, open source and um, the open source governance practice. I'll talk about the procedures, which will be quite boring. So uh, my PDF version can be downloaded, so I'm going to talk about it very fast. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the procedures. And also I'll talk about um, the selection of a license. So Kai Yuan Shi was founded in October under CSDN and uh, Give Cafe and uh, some other committees. So it was uh, supported by open source individuals, communities, and uh, enterprises. And uh, it's actually established under volunteers. So, for this uh, platform, uh, we work under the principles of contribution, consensus, and uh, governance. We call it a community of community. We hope that in China, we are going to promote a sustainable open source community. And we hope that uh, in China, the open source community can contribute to the global community of open source. So currently, we work in four areas. So actually, the mission of our community includes uh, four areas. Some people will say that uh, uh, for our society, we do not have our technology, but the fact is that our technology is uh, faced towards uh, developers. So we have four missions. The first one is open source governance, which means uh, to have horizontal management on this community. Second, we're going to have community development. We believe one plus one is over two, so we develop as a community. The third one is uh, going international. We have done a lot of work in this area. For example, we'll work with uh, many international foundations. And uh, when we come to China, actually many international foundations already know us, and uh, they get to work with us. And uh, the last part is open source uh, projects. So these are our missions. Let me talk about it one by one. First one is open source governance. So as uh, for our conference, usually in the past we had a smaller conferences, and in recent years there are bigger and bigger conferences about open source. So actually this kind of governance includes um, the open source process guidance, open source license, and uh, legal advisory, etc. So you can go to our website for more information. Uh, for example, 
we provide um, the automatic selection of uh, open source online and uh, we also provide a legal advisory service we also launched the China Open Source Ecosystem Report in China. So for the Open Source Initiative, Kai Yuanshu is the only member in this community. So in terms of community development, we have our annual conference. This year, we are going to have our annual conference on November 2nd and 3rd. It's called Coscon. And also, we have a hackathon and uh, online and offline programs, and also Linux activities. As for going international, we work with many top international foundations. So this is also the part that we are very good at. We assist communities and governments and companies to work with international foundations. And also, we have our open source uh, platform. We help open source developers with their projects and also link them to the business's needs. We help for the hardworking programmers while contributing to open source can also get recognized and accepted by and adopted and even incentivized by businesses. So the next is that uh, hack platform, the hack marathon platform. We have organized dozens of hacking marathons in starting 2018 with, with the participation of Microsoft. It was, this platform was donated to to Kai Yuanshe. So also we have the WeChat robots. So earlier today I was talking to some colleagues from Tencent in talking about what the WeChat robots can do. Because a lot of the communication is done on WeChat. Like in other countries, they usually use email for their work. In China, they talk about work on WeChat and social media a lot. So now the WeChat robot can help every group to keep track of their conversations. The chat history can be seen to Peter, which is on GitHub. So all the chat history is there, it's documented there, so there's a, there's a log of the daily, a daily log of the uh, conversation or chat history sent to your mailbox. And also, the new, new official website is migrated to the GitHub, and also, we make this annual report of open source in China, and if you go to our exhibition booth, you can scan the QR code and fill out your profile. And some of, I can see that people were working hard and treating the questionnaire seriously. So that if you go to the, go there and get signed up, and then we can send you the 2019 China Open Source Annual Report as well, when we make it available. So here is the organizational structure. And we are volunteers. We are a not-for-profit organization. We have seven directors and also ten working groups, and one executive committee, one executive director, and also we have an advisory committee, which are good friends and experts from China and other parts of the world. And also we have the regulatory committee, regulatory advisory committee, like Kevin Huang here and many other old friends who are often giving us advice. So these are the directors of this, of 2019, and we are very special compared with other foundations in other countries, because you can see three of them are ladies. They are good looking ladies who are also very competent. I mean, we have uh, man, we have so many women on our 
board. Uh, and you can see that this is the executive committee and the 10 working groups. So they have division of work. And some work on regulatory affairs and on media, on open source education, and so on. After five years, we gradually built up the competence because everybody has to work 996, you know, and they spend their spare time at night or on weekends and make things happen little by little. This year's China Open Source Conference will take place in Shanghai. You can join us as a volunteer or as, as an audience member. Either way will be good. You can see how by just using so few staff members or volunteers we organize the China Open Source Conference every year. And this QR code is Kai Yuan Shou's official account on WeChat. You are free to follow us. You are welcome to follow us. And next, I want to talk about the open and open source. As we know, open source is becoming more and more adopted by businesses because they can deploy faster and the development is better, maintenance is cheaper. They used to be a specialized uh, customized software like lots of the customization and lots of these business software suites and now in the in the world of open source, they can download it and do a lot of integration rather than customization. Of course, there's still customization, but we can see that more and more Chinese companies are participating in open source, in using them and more and more in developing open source. But meanwhile, it's becoming more complex because there are so many choices. You have so many licenses, source source codes, and compatibility issues, updating, and so on. There are so many choices, especially in the world of cloud. We know about its openness, about open source, and between software, between licenses, there, there are always compatibility issues. So are they really open? There are so many options, many users and businesses find it difficult. Today, I was talking to a government official. They do standardization. So in recent years, the government has been changing its role. It's changing its role from being by providing the, the instruction to helping the ecosystem to grow. They want to really know what the grassroots level people are thinking, what the businesses and developers are thinking. So just now I talked about openness and open source. So openness is a bigger is a bigger topic. Open source doesn't just it's not everything for openness because openness is also about the standardization and the community. The standardization is very important. So in open source and non open source, there are lots of standards. If everybody respects these standards, it will be easy for us to communicate. But there are projects and software that didn't follow these standards because they were so big, they thought they were the standard setter. They were the standards themselves. However, we still need interoperability and lots of communication between us. So if you think about the Open source is only part of the ecosystem. If you think about an open ecosystem, it will definitely include open source and community and standards and interoperability. So, up to now, I want to say that worldwide, more and more businesses are participating in open source by using it or by even participating in the development of it. So here is the statistics from the research done by Apache Foundation. What is the most successful governance model for open source governance? And according to their research, the big open source foundations can do projects that are 
That are bigger, bigger than one company's project, no matter it's open source or not open source, or by yeah project by small organization. So these big foundations have much bigger projects in terms of community size and the user group size. Then, when businesses participate in open source development, they do their math on ROI. So usually, they expect five times a return investment because they have so many users and participants. So, like for one single company, like MySQL, Qt, and OpenOffice, they are usually smaller. Projects with smaller communities and fewer number, fewer developers, and fewer daily submissions. And about these big foundations, like top nine biggest foundations, usually the average number of developers is over one thousand, and the daily code submission is over one hundred. This is the, from the research by Apache. So, for not-for-profit foundations, how should they help the community grow? The most important way is that the businesses will understand that they should work closely with these big foundations rather than working in isolated ways, so that they will have bigger market potentials and bigger size. Because the more users participate, the more contributors. Contribute the bigger the community will be, especially the foundation-guided communities. Then they will have more clients and more code contributions. This will lead to a positive cycle. Just now we learned about the introduction. So. Because the open source is adopted by many businesses in other countries, and lately in China, if you think about the big companies like Baidu, Huawei, Alibaba, Tencent, and many others, JD and DD and 360, they have been participating in open source. So because there is the economic factor. The return investment it helps the business. And next, I want to talk about this. When you use so many, uh, when you use so much open source software, how do you govern the community? So actually, many people think it's just about licensing, but actually, license is part of it. There's also risk management and also regulatory governance and also community governance about how to develop your community. Just now I talked about the interoperability and the community. They are very important. So how do you develop the community and also how do you have good governance for one single project? I mean, open source governance is a very big framework. Okay, next this. This is. A quotation from the president of ASF. He says, "Open source governance is a social framework." Today, I may not have time to really talk about open source licensing. I mean, there's a lot to say about open source licensing. It's a legal framework, and we know open source governance. It's A social framework. So licensing is only the legal part of the framework. Many people, many companies understand the importance of open source. They want to use it. They want to adopt it. They want to contribute to it. So these companies need open source governance. They need a virtual team or a Tangible or intangible team to govern the open source work. It's part of the extension of their operations. So if you look at the big companies like Google, Intel, Microsoft, and many others, and also many startups like Facebook, GitHub, Twitter, and so on, these companies they they have this to do group. <coughs> So this is the head of our open source education team. He's a very good writer. I read his writing every day, and he also has this book reading club. He started it. Right, has very high requirement to join in. So 
This is the help from some open source experts. They are helping us. About the open source office, many companies are having it already. So what do they actually do? What can they help? What can they help with the open source office? Open source project office, like OSPO. So I want to show this slide and excuse me. So the Open source project program office can do lots of things like strategy, process, policy, education, and popular popularization, community relations, and regulatory affairs, compliance, and also technical guidance. It can do lots of things. The OSPO, open source program office. So there are many details I will not go into today. First, we need to have a team leader. So, for every company or for every project, we need to have a leader to implement the strategies. So, we need to first choose the leader. And after that, we need to define what we're going to do and collect feedback from different departments and also gain support from different functions. And also, it needs to, to decide whether it's going to be a cross function or whether it belongs to a specific department. For example, for Microsoft, it is under the engineering department. It was called uh, Microsoft uh, Open Technology. And uh, I was also a part of it. And some actually put it in and, uh, marketing and uh, developer relationship. For Netflix, it has uh, a cross-function team because it's a B2C company. So as uh, for the staff members, there are also different uh, types of uh, staff members. For example, there needs to be a project manager, and also uh, we need to have uh, the legal staff, and also the OSRB, which actually is uh, a committee with uh, people from different uh, departments. Moreover, there are also governance tools and uh, training staff who are responsible for that. And also, there are people who are responsible for developing tools and uh, systems and uh, integration. So it can be big or small. And it's very flexible. So I'm going to talk about a few cases. So one is about a Twitter. So for Twitter, it was an open source from day one. It started with 4,000 employees. And currently, there are over 300 million active users. And every day, there are about 500 million tweets. 80% of mobile users. So as a, for an open source office, it can do something different. It has a more broader view. So it has uh, open standards, and uh, it's also part of open data. It may use of open data, open source, open standards, and uh, community management uh, and outreach. So for open source office, 
it aims at the highest and more strictness. So it aims at less bureaucracy. Second, it, it aims at a more pleasant open source procedure. And that means to have a more pleasant environment. Number three is to have a higher efficiency to protect the company. And number four is to establish a community for its key projects. Without a community, it's hard for a project to succeed. So actually, people say that a project is successful if they launch it without um, the contribution from others. But the fact is that uh, it's hard for the community to grow if you have this kind of mechanism. So one of the foundations said that for an average project, which is not excellent, if you have a community to support it, it will get more excellent. If you believe that your project is good enough and you don't need more contribution from the outside, then this project is probably not going to grow. So as for open source project in China and in other countries, there are many differences. So for many projects, they protect themselves and they do not grow and they do not uh, attract uh, contributors from the outside. Well, actually, education and uh, culture are really important. So I have five minutes. And uh, what does Twitter learn? Well, actually, it has a bootstrap. Sorry, I had some technical problems, so I had to speed up. So Twitter learned a lot from its uh, projects. For example, Apache License 2.0 and MIP. So at the beginning, you need to choose a permissive license, not copy lab. And it has learned a lot in time management and in community management. It has learned a lot of methods too. So they work with the academics and universities very closely. So for different projects, they have uh, different uh, learnings. They also work with uh, the Open Source Foundation, for example, for Mesos. They work in big data, and they gained a lot of uh, best practice. And also they learned from uh, train catch. And also the um, upstream has been given privilege in this project. So due to limitation of time, I'm not going to talk about everything. So after the open source, it has the contributions from different uh, sources and from different countries. And this has actually enhanced the dynamics of the project. So what they have learned is that uh, contribution will bring more influence and the uh, community is born with uh, the contribution of uh, outsiders. So what I want to emphasize is that every company should ask itself many questions when it is involved in open source. So uh, I have the PDF version online for you to download. So as for open source, it has uh, eight elements. So as for the eight elements uh, listed here, they are very important, but I didn't have time to talk about it one by one. So as for compliance, well, at the beginning, the company needs to know that for open source, what are the advantages of it? Are there going to be advantages in technology? And uh, as for the open source uh, projects, so when it is uh, part of uh, our product, what kind of value can we find from it? What is the cost and the risks? And 
uh, whether there are trust from the community. And then, as uh, for M&A or business negotiations or sales or product uh, launch, whether the open source is uh, going to make contribution and what needs to be prepared for it. And also, as for the supply chain, especially for OEN, we need to have uh, the open source uh, supply chain to bring more reliability. I don't think I have time to cover the rest of my presentation. So there are a lot of things that I wanted to mention, but uh, due to limitation of time, I'm not going to talk about it. So the next issue I wanted to talk about is uh, the procedures for selection of a license, uh, for example, for the project report and uh, the software programs. So as for the procedures, we need to answer the questions before we start the procedures. And after that, then we would have the fund for it. And then, as uh, for the software tools and uh, third-party manufacturers, then we give our investment. We also need to know more about the resource and the database. Sorry, I didn't have time for that. As uh, for the configuration and the preparation, I'm also going to skip it. And there are some resources that uh, you can go to, and uh, in my PDF version, you can get more information from it. And uh, this is about uh, getting the code in different resources. So this is about uh, the running policy. So this is about the compliance check procedure. This is about request and approval procedures. This is about auditing and reporting. And this is about the open source governance tools. And you can actually find it online. I was talking to Linux Foundation, and uh, there are some tools like SPDS, which we can use. So this is about uh, open source management uh, methods. So with uh, this kind of uh, tools, then there are a lot of uh, help that you can get from it, but uh, this is not important. There are some details that can be quite challenging for you. So, at the selection of tools, you need to talk to experts or consultants before you use it. So, this is about how Google did its open source. And you can refer to my PDF version. Sorry, I don't have time for talking about the procedures. There's a lot I want to cover, but due to limitation of time, I don't have time for the rest of it. Thank you for listening.